Good afternoon. Welcome to our study session this afternoon. So, which is first? Principal report. So, Curie. All right. So, this afternoon we have a report from uh, Curie STEM Elementary School. So, we'll turn it over to Principal Valerie Aragon. Bienvenida. Bienvenidos a todos. Awesome team. Superintendent Whitney, Whitney, excuse me, board members. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting Curie to be first. <laughs> <laughs> and I was telling my my team, you know, I can present to several hundred people, but give me my peers and I'm, I'm <laughs> right? So, but no, uh, we're super excited to spend um, this afternoon um, with you. I'm very proud of the work that we um, are doing at Marie Curie STEM. So as you know, um, we're located, we're one of the four STEM elementary schools located in East Pasco. I think our RA traditions are rich in that we opened um, in 2015 and many of you um, selected our, our namesake, but what I want to tie is to our school colors. And so we are outrageous green, which I think um, ties in nicely with our outrageous outcomes. And we really are dedicated to have outrageous learning in our building. And then we're also gray matter silver because there was a, a definite choice in our staff to, to go to Curie as it was a choice for me. Love the East Pasco community, love our kids, and truly believe that we grow gray matter through intentional instructional um, implementations and other strategies that we're gonna talk um, today. We are 95% free and reduced, we're 96% um, Hispanic, but we don't see these as roadblocks. We see them as opportunities and challenges that we um, have evidence that we're overcoming and truly um, trying to um, reduce that achievement gap. So that culture of learning, and again, I think it's from the, from the get-go, we're committed to make sure that our kids had a great experience. Not only love school, but that we have evidence of student learning. And so today, again, we don't have enough time to talk about all the great things that are taking place at Curie, but we are gonna talk about the consistent, high academic and behavioral expectations that we've created, um, cultivating our why, right? And we'll talk specifically about strategies of mission statement, encouraging a growth mindset and a college and career readiness um, environment. We had the opportunity to attend an AVID um, training this past summer and felt like it really, really um, complemented some of the things that we were already doing in our building in just more of a systematic way. And then identify some key strategies that we're implementing that um, have been very powerful in collecting data our, as ourselves, our adults, as well as with our students. Um, and then celebrating success. We celebrate small wins weekly, monthly, daily at Curie. And so that's kind of uh, summarizes what we're going to talk about. The next couple of slides are our data, because what was presented to us is to talk about our data in a data opportunity. So this data here, I'm going to move, I don't like mine there, mm -hmm. is, um, as you know, we opened and we welcomed students from five different elementary schools. And then we averaged those scores and this is what we had, okay? Right, and so our goal was to, to get better, right? To create more success, more proficiency for our students. So 8% of the students were um, proficient in ELA and 9% mathematics. Okay, that was the scores that were coming to us with. Okay. And so this was a cohort of students. So these were our, our exiting sixth graders last year. So they came to us as fourth graders, right? They took the S fun in spring, and this is what they had. And so we're proud, we're not happy, we're not done, right? But we're very proud of the academic achievement that our students experienced at Curie, and that they've continued to experience academic achievement as they've gone into the middle schools. What is this, what did you say, third grade or sixth grade? So they're current sixth graders. Do you have the same data for third grade? Does it look similar? The, this is a cohort. This so, is a cohort. So the fourth yes. grade, fifth grade, sixth grade. Yeah. This was okay. our graduating students last year from when they were in fourth grade. Yeah. Okay. Same student. Gotcha. So that's a great question, though. And so what we're going to kind of show with the next two um, slides and two is I know we transitioned to Star 360. We're still becoming familiar with it. And so these uh, monitoring strategies are what we, we're, currently gonna, we're currently doing with Star and collecting that. Um, but here is another, I think, example of the of the how we look at data as a leadership team, as grade level teams, as a building, as students, as we as we go on through our presentation. So this is where I confuse some people today. So let me try to walk you through this. <laughs> but we're going to start with the sixth grade. Okay. So and where it's confusing is possibly what I have here is data from an academic school year, right? So we test kids in the fall and in the spring and start and math, excuse me, right? Some of us did it in mid. 
Um, but what we had the conversations um, as well is an academic school year will be spring this spring, correct? But if we want to see a full year's grow. And so as, as MAP, we know that, um, that typically kids, if they get an eight point increase, eight to 10 points, depending on where the risk score was at, that was considered a year's growth. Okay? So as we talked about earlier, we have to close that achievement gap. So we have to do a year's plus. And so as a leadership team and as a staff, we're always challenging ourselves to get the year's plus. We want to have the 16, 18, 24 points. But this data here is as an entire building, okay, as an entire grade level. If an entire grade level can have 9, 10, 11 points, then we are truly close to achievement gap for students. And so here would be the example here. So these fifth grade students right here, this is their end of, this was their spring fifth grade, right? In spring of, of 16. Then they went to sixth grade, and this is their fall. So from spring, there were 202, they entered sixth grade, they took the math in the fall, it was a 208, and then in the spring, there were a 215 as a grade level. As a grade level. So this is grade level data. When I celebrate that, we celebrate it as a, as a grade level, as a team in schools, because that's significant growth at that red score. Okay, the reality is, is we didn't quite meet that proficiency that they needed to be, but the growth is important. The growth system that we're going to celebrate and that our kids can are demonstrating that they can achieve at high levels and they can meet proficiency um, with intentional instructional strategies. So if we kind of explain this then too, all right, so then this right here, this 198, again, was the end of their third, uh, excuse me, fourth grade so as they went in, they, they ended at a 211, a full, that, that year's look, okay? If you want to just look at fifth grade, for example, and at a 199, to a 211. Okay. So we look at multiple measures, and so again, this is kind of like if we were pulling onion, these are still the outer layers, right? ESPA, MAP, and then of course we have our classroom based assessments as well. But MAP at least is something that we are very familiar with, that we could utilize that data to show our instructional effectiveness, our kids moving. That's what's important. Yeah, and so. We'll keep on going. I can talk this forever. Right? <laughs> again, I'm reading that too. And so again, we celebrate that success that we're seeing achievement levels increase. Um, we look at individual classroom, individual students, and then again as a cohort. And the grade level is really important because we are really striving to work on collaboration. That's something that needs intentional work as well. But if there are strategies that are working in Mr. Grimm's classroom, I want to replicate those strategies. Because if she's having a 24 point gain, right? I'm um, having a 12 point gain, what can I do in my instructional strategies to ensure that those students have the same? Achievement. Okay, I'm Christy Grimm. I am the assessment facilitator and reading intervention teacher. I'm also finishing up my administrative internship. So today I'm going to talk to you about consistency. That is the key to our successes at Curie. So with the adoption of new curriculums, we've had opportunities to work as a staff to identify where we're at, what we need to do, and how do we get there through integrated lesson plans focused around STEM. We also work with um, the frame of mind that it's not an educational lottery. Our students get what they get. They get the same or the same experiences in multiple classrooms. So whether you walk into my classroom, Amanda's classroom, or Abel's classroom, you're going to see consistency across the grade level team. That's our goal, and being consistent is key. Um, we this year are really taking it a step further by creating a school-wide schedule, much like a middle school schedule. We have a common schedule with um, A groups and B groups per grade level, and then the, um, we have an intervention time that's designated for reading time and a math time. During that time, our uh, special ed students are served in pull-out resource so that they're not missing that core instruction, so they're guaranteed that core curriculum whenever possible. We also have a school-wide behavior expectation um, that is focused around the Curie 3, be respectful, be responsible, be safe. We focus on a matrix that is intentionally taught in the common areas. We have common language with the kids. We use Class Dojo as a point system. Kids are rewarded for being safe, uh, responsible, and respectful. There are also uh, parent communication back and forth, much like texting. So parents are able to communicate with the teacher in real time. Their points from Dojo are transitioned into Curie Cash. So we have a token economy in our school. The kids get paid bi-monthly. Paydays are a big deal. They get to go to the Curie store and buy a variety of items. 
So consistent um, behavioral expectation, we have to put consistent academic expectations. And it starts with us, the leadership of our school improvement teams. We um, formulate goals at the beginning of the school year. Our grade level teams also establish goals, uh, which also then is in, in part of their TPEC process. And those are our SMART goals. And then we share that information with the students and tie them to priority standards. And they develop those student growth goals. So it's really focused on all of the focus on student growth. Right, and then how we communicate with the parents, and we'll share that then too. They're monitoring their students' progress and meeting the goals, um, but it's all of us, admin, teachers, student parents, working for that student achievement. Um, I'm sixth grade, and then this year actually we had fifth grade as well, um, transition to student-led conferences, and that was an adjustment for our community, right? They're used to just coming in and talking to the teacher, but it was super powerful this year, especially too with our binders, our organizational binders, for them to go to their student growth goals and to then demonstrate how they're um, progressing, right? And if they're not, those are difficult conversations. Why aren't you? And I heard those. I'm not doing my homework. I'm not studying. I'm not practicing. And that's why you're not seeing that student achievement. Um, and for students to be able to articulate that to the parents is, is, was very powerful. All right. Um, hello, my name is Abel Lopez. I'm a sixth grade math and science teacher. Um, I wanted to share how we are using data to look at how we're going to update our intervention groups. We have intervention and um, enrichment or extension classes that we are um, having for math and reading. So we use that data and we um, split up our kids into to different groups. They go and um, we can get smaller class sizes and we are, are focusing on where their, where their needs are at. And we have a 30 minute math and a 30 minute reading intervention time. In that, we we're also working on getting our kids to understand um, growth mindset and understand that, yeah, you're not understanding it yet, you're not getting it, you're not meeting grade level expectations, but not yet. Understand that it's not yet, but you will, and you just gotta keep trying. And that's what we've focused on. We've done it in the past, but this year has been a real emphasis that we're, we're really um, going with. All right, so at Curie, oh sorry, I'm Amanda Wilson. <laughs> also um, sixth grade language arts and STEM. And um, at Curie, we are setting high expectations for academics. And some of the ways that we do that is we make sure that we communicate data with students. Um, when they take an assessment, we mark it um, on graphs, which we'll show you here in a minute. Um, students, we feel like, should really know how they're performing how they're performing in their class, how they're performing as a grade level, and also, you know, just how are they performing, like on STAR testing, how are they performing nationwide, right? They should know where they're at. Um, students should also um, have goals that are written, that are very clear and concise, and they you know, time bound and um, specific for students. Um, students should also track their growth. Like we said, they graph their own scores, they reflect many, many times during the course of a unit of study. And then, of course, we celebrate our success. That is something that I really enjoy at Curie. Any little success, we celebrate, right? We celebrate in the classroom. We celebrate um, outside um, of our classroom in assemblies that honor those growths that students are making. So here are some uh, examples of student uh, data. And uh, you can see there's, there's pieces of data from every subject that we teach from intervention time to math, um, STEM, and ELA. Um, we'll just draw your attention to this one up here. We have students who, on our first attempt at uh, an assessment, didn't do so great, 58%, not meeting standard. Um, they, they reflect on that, they figure out what could I have done better, and then they take the assessment again, a new form, and um, look at that, 92%. Right? And then they look at that and they say, well, I still have 8% of growth I can still make. Right? So what can I do? How can I make it better? And this is what they say. Right? Um, these are reflections from student tests. Like, uh, I believe I did a good job, but I can still improve my, uh, by reading the questions more carefully. Or by listening to vocabulary at home. So they're using resources at home. Um, or just saying, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to push myself hard. And you know, these are our kids. And um, when they make those reflections, they really, they can really, um, it's like back to that growth mindset, right? That they're just, they're, they know what they've done wrong, they know how to improve it, and they're going to improve it. So if we go back a little quick, the consistency is in two, and I kind of missed this 
this point that you know, we develop those SMART goals or team, um, team goals. And as we also then monitor that we have um, common assessments that we come to you, agree that we're going to monitor student learning, we come together as a collective team and then discuss student performance. Okay. and discuss how we're going to intervene so that kid, more kids become proficient. Right. Yes, proficiency is the goal, but also we also monitor level one. Are we reducing the amount of students in level one? Because that's really critical to so have a, a, you know, overwhelming task, right, when you look at our initial data. But not only are we increasing the number of students' proficiency, but we're also decreasing the number of students that are in the level one that are making that slow um, progress um, to becoming proficient. Sorry, I'm not really aware of I'll talk about this green form. So we have a Curie green form that is school-wide. It's a school-wide form. We had a similar form with MAP. And um, learning the new STAR system, we're getting there. The form's still getting a little tweaked. This is an actual uh, student sample. So we, we start with their Smarter Balance. They're different grades. So school-wide, we have this for all of the kids. Uh, the kids fill it out. They can see where they're, they're up to 21, where they're at, where their STAR score falls. And then they're able to take their scale score, we thought grade level equivalent, but then we decided not to do that, so we're kind of adjusting as we go. And then the student gets to do, to, they get to talk about their successes and think about what they can do differently the next time they take the assessment to prepare for that building. What can I, what did I do well, and what am I going to focus on? Uh, we're in the middle of our winter window right now, the official window, so this is a work in progress. <coughs> Justin Axel is in this awkward fifth grade classroom. They took the star last week. She was conferencing with the kids. There's a great little report that they can print out that shows the first time. Fifth grade, this is the third time that we've done the star. And so um, she was conferencing with this young lady. She was celebrating success. She made a 50 point jump from the fall. And then she, um, again, had that many celebration student. And then she was staying the report home. So parents <coughs> were sure. So again, so we're notifying parents as well that continuous student achievement. So this is just one more example of how we um, keep track of our data and our growth. This is on STAR assessment. You can see where the students started, um, where they were at after their uh, next interim assessment. And the great thing about this one is this is their target. Mm -hmm. So students can see just how close they are to hitting that target, um, target score. Mm -hmm. So as we mentioned before, we celebrate um, student success often, student, staff to students, students to students, and staff to staff. Um, this is really important. Um, I think, again, it's that reality of that, um, what proficiency means in that previous example. I think it's important that we're honest with our students, but then the tie in that growth mindset, if you're not there, what do you need to do to get to that, to that, to that level of proficiency? Um, as well, there's a picture that follows that kind of shows real quick um, some of our um, assemblies and again just to see the faces right that's a benefit of mine and client students that they're so proud the parents are proud we have some certificates that i know many of us do as well but i think it's very valuable that we that we do this as a system it's great in the classrooms the classrooms teams and also have different awards um, that they um, utilize to recognize a student for achievement and there's a couple things we, we recognize for proficiency right because mm -hmm. i think that's important are you meeting the standard that's really important our kids will tell you are they close to that standard as well as we celebrate growth right because a, a gain is a gain and we want to uh, build on that this is one other way we celebrate um, this is student to student celebrations and you can see they're curing three awards and they are nominating each other for um, our curing three being safe being responsible being respectful and then you know, really just verbalizing what it is that these students are doing that makes them, um, you know, being honored. Um, as previously mentioned, we have started Abbott Elementary School, and so we have three commitments for Abbott. We want to provide a culture of a growth mindset, career and college readiness, organization. Uh, we have some reading strategies we use, annotating text strategies we use, and note-taking strategies. Each grade level team, our A teams and B teams, have adopted a college that has a large number of STEM degrees. And so they're, you know, these two represent Navy and Air Force. Air Force. <laughs> oh, yes, Navy's a specialist, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but we really focused around that. And the kids talk about it. And we also talk about, it's not just college, there's career readiness. So if you look so the next slide, this is our why. Here's the sample of our fourth graders and their future. There are future world changers. A variety of goals. You know, one wants to be a house 
builder, one wants to be a doctor, but they have a variety of goals. And those conversations are intentional. Um, and they can't be assumed they're, ha they're had. We have to explicitly teach how do you get to college, how do you get a career, and how to be successful in life. So that's our big focus this year. So that was fourth grade. It's important for us all to know why we're here, whether it's a staff, why we're here. One of those difficult times, we got to remember, we're here to, <laughs> to make a difference. Um, and our students need to know that too. Our students need to know why they're here. Through the, through the difficult times, they need to remember, okay, I'm here for this, and I, I, I'm going to pull through this. And so we, we share our, with our students our, the mission statement, our school mission statement, but we take it a step further. Um, as a sixth grade, we created classroom mission statements. And when I did it in my classroom, it became, uh, okay, what do you need in your, in your class to make this the most successful year you've ever had? To do more learning than you've ever done. They gave me some words, we put it together, and it became this one in the middle here. And we started off uh, by reading it every day before class. And after a while, kids started to, to memorize it. It became theirs. We, the elements in room 222, are here at school to make our families proud and prepare for our future. We want to succeed in sixth grade math and science. We will be organized, have high expectations, and never give up. And it was amazing to see how they went from yeah. monotone <laughs> to powerfully saying this. I'm like, you know, I was getting emotional in class just yeah. like watching them. I had to stop and say, wow, look at how my class has changed, you know. And um, it became not just uh, knowing the school rules anymore. It became, why are we here? Are you making your family proud? Are you preparing for your future right now? Are you giving up? And so, our, so that is the discussion every single day. Then one further step was to take it from school to classroom to individual. And as an individual, uh, this student here says, I am a curious element that works hard to make my family proud. I am here to be successful and to learn. I want to, be, to get good grades so later I can have a chance to go to college by studying, listening in class, and try my hardest and everything. And here's one more example that you'll find in our hallways. Um, not only do they have their mission statement down at the bottom, they they have their quotes that they have that they put with it that inspire them to get through the difficult times, to get through um, a minor setback, a failure. It's okay to fail as long as we're learning from those failures. And so you'll see this in our classrooms, you'll see this in our hallways, and you'll see this on uh, their each of their binders, they have two binders <coughs> that they carry around, and um, our focus boards that they put up around them when they're testing. You'll see their, their mission statements and their quotes as well. So when I did this activity, I just have to say real quick, they were so proud um, in this classroom. And you, and you notice every teacher did a little bit different than the twist, right? But I'm a curious student, uh, a curious sixth grade student. I'm here to learn. I will accomplish my hopes and dreams by graduating high school and college. What a great mission statement. And so, um, really, in, in this conclusion, we're happy to answer any questions. Is that through these consistent um, strategies, we really truly believe we're building brain matter, and, and students are having lots of that kind of success. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well done. Lots of great things going on there. So, your will you take questions? Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Anybody have a question? I, I'm just wondering about the, the student um, parent teacher um, conferences. And so how does it go with the with excuse me, with the student giving the parent the at the conference? How does it, how does it <coughs> so uh, we've done student led conferences for quite a long time. We both came from uh, Stevens Middle School mm -hmm. and then um, transferred to Curie. And um, so student-led conferences are just something that we've done for so long. And the, the way that the students do it, they use those data pieces mm -hmm. that we showed you, right? Um, of course they have the report card, but the report card doesn't really tell them right. anything, right? I'm a level three or I'm a level four or whatever. It doesn't really get to the heart of what the student has and, um, and what they're lacking. 
So when the students show that data, they can show their parents, you know, well, this is where I started, but look where I'm at. So if I'm a level one student, um, parents are like, why do you have all these ones on your report card? Right? A student can say, hey, but look, I was like, you know, 13% here, mom. And then I studied and I used this, you know, these tips and, and I got to a 40 and, and then, look, mom, I got here. I'm up here. I'm not passing yet, but I'm on the way. And that's powerful for kids. Mm -hmm. It's powerful for parents, too. Well, what to I see love, that, you know, we yeah. are growing. <laughs> Sorry, man, but then also with the students, then it's showing the actual assessment, right? The actual common mm -hmm. assessment is, is uh, parents can see what's being expected of their students and how to respond. Um, and I thought that was, that, that's been actually very uh, powerful for our parents to understand because, I mean, honestly, as a fifth grade science assessment, a sixth grade math assessment is very challenging if we were to compare it to our, or some of our parents' backgrounds. So it's really important that they're able to see what the expectations are for their students and how we're preparing and getting them to meet that expectation. That's okay, and I just, I tell my students all the time, it's like, when we're preparing for conferences, I say, I didn't give you the grade. You mm -hmm. earned the grade, so explain the grade. Mm -hmm. Explain it to your family. Um, and you will see some really happy <coughs> conversations, and you will see some sad conversations. Moms, you know, wagging the finger or whatever. But it is the best conversations to be in. Um, and of course, we're always there to come into the conversation, um, ask parents, ask us questions. So I always start by greeting, greeting the family and, and getting them started and showing, here's, here's your stuff, go ahead and start sharing this with their family. They know what they're gonna go through. And then I let them have some time. Let, let them show their organization, or lack thereof. But most of the time, it's a pretty good organization and it's, got, it's getting a lot better, especially with our emphasis this year. Um, but then I can come in and say, well, first off, this wasn't in the right order, let me, let me show you that. Um, that's part of their issue, they need to they need to improve on. Um, but look at what all these great things that they are doing. And he, he or she um, showed you some of it. Let me show you some more. And then um, there's always a few questions that I, I open it up to. And then typically, that's all they need. Um, there's a few who, who want to sit and talk more. But the majority of our students can handle that, that conversation on their own because they're owning their own. So how many kids do you have in a room at once when you're having these conversations? Is it still, do they still have times and they, so you only have one student parent group in there or are there several? In the past, um, we've done it to where we see every student. So I had every one of my students at the middle school coming through and I tried managing that still at the, at the elementary level, um, but we've gone to just owning our, our, our homeroom and, and discussing that. And, and prepping the other teacher to, to share if, if, if needed. Um, but yeah, we just we just have our homeroom, so I have my 25, 26 students, and they come in and... Um, but the students come in one at a time? So okay. Between six, maybe, maybe six families, to maybe one family. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah. Oh, so yeah. they have a time slot that they can't, so you can't have six at a time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no more than six. And then, um, what in, yeah, what is the packing? Six, six at a time, but uh, yeah. And then you have made the effort also for parents who want that traditional conference, yes. there's time set aside for that as well. Or if there's a need for it, there's more. <laughs> <focused, focused laughs> <conversation. laughs> more staff. Yeah, that, that's a great point, because some parents don't want to, they want to talk to the teacher without the student, right? And so they want to be able to know that that opportunity is readily available, you know, to, to talk about concerns openly. Uh, you touched on this, and uh, Ms. Wilson, I, I had a similar question as, you mentioned report cards and students kind of knowing how they're performing nationwide. I think that's one frustration in, in our elementary school levels is report cards now are twos and threes and fours and pluses and minuses, and you really don't have an idea of like, how is your student really doing? That's a common uh, frustration I hear from parents um, at work and, and even I've had with my own kids so what um, you know what are we doing you mentioned like some of these assessments and it, the numbers also don't mean anything right okay you're 600 on the ALPA or you're 22 like what does that mean and is there a way are we with the star or with other mechanisms where we're gonna be able to provide more uh, just make it more clear like you know as a parent you really want to know like like don't sugarcoat it is my child really behind in reading like are they a year behind or six months are they are how are they in math and how do I help them I think that's information that like as a parent that you really want to know like get, don't don't sugarcoat it like yeah we're gonna we're working hard but 
but let me know where they're at so we yes student led conferences help us not sugarcoat anything you know it it, it really benefits the well, also, yeah, I was going to say, um, a lot of the classrooms, the grade levels have decided on a two, a, a four, three, two, one scale. What does that consist of? So when do you have that consistent grading across the, the board? So if, you know, if I'm a child in this range here, there's been a conversation that's probably had that I'm a level two right now, where that score is. I want the box or above to be a level three. So there's that conversation that does happen <coughs> in the classrooms happens differently at each grade level and with each assessment. Yes. I mean, because like with STAR, we don't really know a whole lot about STAR yet. Getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> with maps, we were like, um, okay, your score is a 215, high five, you're on level. You know, like mm -hmm. we, we knew exactly what those numbers meant. With STAR, we get this band, right? And mm -hmm. um, so there's the sixth grade band. We want to get inside and out of, you know, that band. We want to get ready for seventh grade that way. And with the map report, the map report that we call the parents, we need that information as well, whether it's a standard uh, you know, scale score, third grade education, give you information as to what percentile they are, their <coughs> functioning at, right? Which is more of that national comparative data as well. Yeah. And in, in my class, I know that I'm having those conversations with my students mm -hmm. about Hey, this is how you did on that test. This is what that means. This is what grade level you are. This is how far or how ahead you are of the game. Um, this is how, this is what we're going to do to get you um, higher. This is what we're going to do to catch you up. This is and and then so when they're when they go to show this to their family, they can interpret that. Yeah. There's a lot of color coding too. So if right. you look at this graph, anything that's green is passing. Anything that's red or the pink color is below, like very far below level. And yellow is like that, like you're almost there, right? Like just a little bit more. Um, so the numbers really, like only teachers care about numbers. Okay. <laughs> but but the color, they know what that, what that color means. And the kids want to know where they're at. Like, am I a three on this assessment or am I a two? Where am I at? And well, they have those conversations. Well, with the target then too, back to map, because again, we're creating the star, they, they couldn't wait. They were celebrating that they met the proficiency target. Right, they mm -hmm. can't wait to tell the teacher because they see that media score back yes. um, on, on the map assessment then too. You know, the fifth grade knows what it is to get into the enrichment map at mm -hmm. grade for sixth grade. Uh, if, if Shannon and uh, Jackie were here, they'd say the kids were going and advocating that they'd be placed in the map. <laughs> right? They knew what the target was, they knew their levels then as well. So that's the culture that we're trying to create to prepare our kids to be academically competitive <coughs> and to advocate for themselves as they go in the middle of high school. Well, and how many students do you know that are like, when is the next test? <laughs> I'm ready for the next test. That's what our kids are doing. You know, this kid right here, when is it? Like, we haven't taken our next, uh, in our class, but we take it tomorrow. <laughs> and so they're just like, I heard somebody else have taken the test, and when are we going to do it? And they, they're ready. They want to see growth. So are the STAR assessments, are those going to parents? Or is there a way to access those? I know that there's kind of, we established like a three standard, but you can give them more if you want, like at the elementary level every month. If, is that, so those three, right? Six, six to eight weeks generally is where you want to cycle. Okay, and so, but are, are the three, I think there's three required, are those being sent out to parents or shared? Okay. Yeah, so that like, I remember we had conferences or the initial report that went out um, as well, and I, as I said, and then um, and our student planners will talk about the, that they're taking the STAR, or whatever assessment is that they're achieving, and then making uh, what their score was, and the common assessment for grade right multiplication, right? One of the, the common assessments for mathematical fluency, just um, celebrating that and communicating that with the parents of the in class dojo and or the student planners. Mm -hmm. I, I applaud you, and I, and I understand the efforts be, behind um, behind these these parent-teacher conferences that are teach student-led because when a student can take responsibility for their education they're much more likely to learn and that's really a, an important piece for taking part of their taking responsibility for their own education ha, is this a new thing this year or is this something that you've done since you opened curie sixth grade has done it since we've opened curie and again um i believe the entire team came from middle school mm -hmm. so we just brought that right on down with us and um, yeah and this year um in third fourth and fifth there's still um the focus was the organization of the binder and that there's a data tab in the binders where the students are monitoring their growth and so that's how we um, transition to school-wide is that we're having students and share their academic progress academic success 
through their um, organizational binder. From the second grade up? Is that what I heard? Third, third grade up. Okay. Uh, the organization, the way we organize binders is fairly consistent from three mm -hmm. six. We've, we've established some consistency all the way through. Mm -hmm. So there's not going to be a lot of change in the middle school. Um, all the way from the third through so there's some consistency that's great and then I'm assuming that there are some consistencies that would then lend itself to seven and eight if it's an avid structure so we have seventh and eighth grade avid classes as well and so the middle schools have been focused on avid for quite some time so they'll be they'll be able to kind of blend right into that system and know um, that organizational structure yeah they are <laughs> And again, I think our teachers were a little like, oh, fourth grade and third grade. But um, when we came back, we did some intentional special development and discussion, and, and the kids have become much more organized. Yeah. And we continued with the, um, the continuous PD on our organization, and we had teams create rubrics just last month, and then talking about what do they really want to see in third grade. Because we went in kind of blind, just going by what we heard from the other Abbott Elementary schools, and just really making it work for Curie. And it was great to see teams start with a binder checklist that everyone could use. And they really, you know, at the beginning it was really rough, but it's getting there. And they're like, it's quick now. So, and he was giving kind of to why organizational is a skill. So, this had us need to work on it. But it's a skill that's critical for our kids to have so that they can become, again, academically success and then close that achievement gap. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of wonderful things happening at Curie. And I'm sure we all have lots of questions. Scott, did you have a quick question? Um, yeah. I, I was going to say I appreciated how you guys said that um, that it's not an educational lottery and that consistency is key. And I've heard of us as a board, we're often focusing on consistency and a lot of the actions we take are to um, let Miss Whitney and her staff know where we want to see consistency. And I don't, you guys are proud of your results there. Congratulations. I think they're great. I don't know equivalent numbers for the rest of the schools. And I know it's a hard question because your peers are here and stuff, but for argument's sake, let's say that your scores were higher than the average throughout the district. What would be one or two things you showed us there that you think you're doing differently that would be like best lessons learned and something we should implement across a district? Maybe everything here is stuff that everybody's doing. Maybe everything here is stuff that only you guys are doing, but if you had one or two things to share with us, what would they be? So let me, let me rephrase it. What are one or two actions or things you showed us on here that led to that student success at a higher rate than you would expect to see? Okay, thank you. You know, scores dipped um, um, district-wide at the <coughs> kindergarten to sixth grade level in this first year of implementation of our curriculum. And we kind of expected that, um, that dip. How do you think that teachers are doing with, because adopting at an elementary note level, the, the meat of most everything is your, is your ELA and your mathematics, and those are the two things that change completely all in one year. How are your teachers doing with grasping that and, and being able to teach that and, and teaching the new curriculum and not going back to their old Can their you old give things? us the 30 second version or less? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, but we've got. <laughs> We, uh, yeah, I mean, we've got lots of questions, and I'm sure you would not mind if we showed up at your school and, and, and ask. Yes, I yeah. think that location dip was a, an actual reality. Curie being a STEM school, we went away from our STEM uh, design curriculum lessons for year one that were integrated, intentionally designed, rigorous, um, and we did include or infuse some of the new curriculum. We felt that was a, 
a little bit of detriment for our students based on the data, based on not only the standardized data, but our classroom-based assessments as well. So we're going back to our original plans and including the curriculum, the general, ed, you know, the non-STEM curriculum, what is appropriate to meet those standards. Well, thank you very much. Lots thank of good you. things happening there. And, uh, appreciate you coming. So part two is a <laughs> facilities report, I believe. Is it something like that? Did I get that right? Yes. District policy update, district use of district facilities. Sarah Thornton. A complete 180 from what uh, you were looking at. So I believe our goal is to be done by six. Is that right? Correct. If we go a little over, we'll probably be OK. But, but uh, I keep that in mind. I defer to the board president. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got till 6.30 then. <laughs> okay, so just keep that in mind. Thank you. Do you mind, Bass? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to us. <laughs> oh, that's all right, I could ask you questions all night. Good afternoon, Board President Christensen, uh, Superintendent Whitney, and members of the board. Um, as you recall, um, beginning last April, we uh, launched a new process for the board to start looking at certain district policies in more depth. And the policy that we began with was our current uh, district facilities use policy. So we are going to re-engage in that process um, starting tonight and um, take the next step in that uh, in that analysis cycle. Just to refresh your memory, um, the, the process brings the topic and current language to the board for an opportunity to ask questions, request additional information and, addi and, and additional data. Um, there, it also provides for stakeholder input uh, prior to the board giving direction on any uh, changes that you want to see in the, uh, in the policy. It is intended to be a more proactive and responsive um, process that addresses board and stakeholder concerns as we move through. So this is just a graphic that shows you what that cycle looks like. And where we are in the cycle right now is we are in um, one of the final phases of the input process. Um, where tonight we will hear uh, from uh, additional stakeholders uh, regarding the uh, regarding the facilities use policy. After that, then um, at the end of the session or at the end of the presentation, um, I'll talk with you more and get direction from you about whether or not you would like to get additional input or if we feel ready to move into the discussion and direction phase. So just another reminder that our current uh, facilities use policy was adopted in 1996. Um, it contains language uh, around uh, policy statements from the district and the board encouraging public use of the facility that facilities that don't interfere with the instructional program. Um, it gives first priority for use to district sponsored activities uh, and then creates user three different types of user groups uh, for the purposes of assessing of assessing um, various fees. The first group of stakeholders that you heard from directly uh, were the high school principals, and they presented to you in May their perspective on the way that our current facilities use policy and our current facilities use process is, is working. I don't want to put words don't want to mischaracterize what they told you. I know we, we spent quite a bit of time with them back in May, but the general takeaways from their presentation to you um, were to uh, retain priority to students and district programs, provide for flexibility and scheduling to accommodate extra practices, postseason play, unanticipated needs for the schools to be able to use their facilities, um, ensuring that community use does not impact student safety, um, trying to maximize community use of the high school facilities in the off season where possible, and then also um, maximizing use of elementary and middle schools where that may or 
or may not be occurring at this time. So those were some of the general uh, takeaways from the information that you were presented uh, from, the, uh, from the high schools. For tonight's discussion, uh, you're going to hear um, some information that we got back on a survey that we sent out to our uh, some of our facility users. Uh, and then we also have um, a panel, although it's not going to be presented like a panel because they have to be at the microphone. Um, but we invited uh, Randy Nunnemaker on behalf of the Pasco School District. We invited uh, Brian Ace from the Boys and Girls Club and Mr. Brent Kubalik from the City of Pasco um, to address the board uh, this evening and share some perspective with you. <laughs> So the first thing I'll touch on is the survey that we uh, sent out, uh, survey results that we sent out to our facility users. And the we identified between 50 and 60 uh, individuals or groups who had gone through the district's facility use reservation process uh, to use district facilities over the last 12 months and we sent a brief survey out to them to get their to get their feedback we got about 16 or 17 of those responses back um, and didn't get necessarily complete responses from from everyone so I don't have it it's a, it it's a small enough n and some of the responses were very specific to that organization um, that it, it's not really possible to to quantify it in in a way that I was hoping however there were some key takeaways from the feedback and suggestions that they provided, uh, which I've listed here for you to see. And I think that um, the, the feedback is consistent with what you as a board have heard anecdotally with with the feedback that we as staff have, have heard as well. Um, I think Randy is going to speak to that um, a little bit later too. Um, there were... Um, as with with any feedback survey there there were kudos and complaints so it kind of it was it was really across the board things that generally uh, ident were identified as working well included um, the the value that people felt that they got in being able to access the district facility ie being charged a reasonable fee for what it was that they were able to access uh, the conditions um, the, the the care that we take in maintaining our facilities and the cleanliness of the facilities and that type of thing um, got some consistently good feedback um, and also just having access to emphasizing having access to the facility as a community asset there were several comments about these being taxpayer funded facilities and needing to be accessible by the by the community in in that way um, suggestions for improvement, uh, quite a few comments on scheduling and several specific suggestions for us to have a central facility scheduler. Um, suggestions around uh, improving communication and consistent, consistency for users, um, trying to simplify and streamline that process, um, and of course issues with, um, with groups or organizations getting bumped when they had uh, an event scheduled and uh, something occurring at the school or district level was going to take priority over that and bump their use. So that's the general feedback from, from that survey from, uh, from that specific group of users. As a district, um, besides the, uh, the three identified categories of our um, individuals who, who can use our facilities, which are you know, basically available to rent, We've invited the Boys and Girls Club in the city of Pasco to speak to you tonight because we have specific formal agreements with each of those organizations. Um, we have a we have a, a couple of contracts actually with Boys and Girls Club around use of our facilities. They uh, run the daycare at New Horizons, and in addition, they uh, provide uh, childcare services at several of our elementary schools, um, and we have agreements around that. It's been a long 
running partnership uh, with the clubs as they seek to work with us in serving PASCO students during the times when they are not in school. Now, Brian was not able to uh, be with us tonight. He had to travel over to Olympia, um, but he did. I'm gonna uh, hand this out to you in just a minute as I turn the mic over to Randy. Um, but he did provide a letter um, that he'd like to share with you, just outlining um, some of his suggestions um, and his appreciations for that partnership. Um, he does have a few suggestions in there with regards to development of future facilities, um, specifically um, designing and planning in a way that would enable the club to, uh, for example, locate a portable on the site, much the way that the Tri-Cities Community Health Building is located on the site of Ochoa Middle School, um, so that rather than impacting the building, the club could, for example, purchase their own portable, located on the site, have, uh, have um, care available to families without having to impact the district facility. So, so that's one of the ideas that, that uh, he highlighted in, in that letter. Um, and he is also um, more than willing to come back and talk with you directly. Um, it was just a scheduling issue for, uh, for him tonight. We've also invited, like I said, Randy uh, Nunnemaker to talk to you about the district perspective with regards to the scheduling. Uh, and then after uh, Randy offers his perspective, um, I'd invite Brent to come up and, uh, and uh, offer his perspective from the city. So I'm going to turn it over to them. <coughs> Thank you, Sarah. Uh, board President Christensen, Superintendent Whitney, and board members, um, thank you for the opportunity to, to share on this. It's, a, it's an important topic. First, I'd like to kind of do an overview of where we're at and kind of how the process works right now from the district. Uh, right now, I oversee a part-time staff member for facilities use. That staff member uh, works in the district to help schedule those facilities, takes in information from the outside user groups. Uh, as uh, Ms. Thornton mentioned, there's a, we have a long time relationship with uh, the Boys and Girls Club and the City of Pasco. We actually have an agreement with the City of Pasco for use, a uh, reciprocal agreement for use of our facilities where they have an opportunity to use our gyms, some our tennis courts, things like that at no charge. Uh, along with that, we have access to the softball fields at the track, and uh, it's been a great partnership, and we've been able to share that. So uh, that agreement is in place. So as we talk about the process, you'll see where that fits in. Uh, right now, the, the district always has, of course, first option on the facilities. The schools get to use their facilities for what the, the, the school's needs are. Uh, second to that, then we would come behind and then it's the city of Pasco we would look at to be able to provide those uh, facilities for the use for our, our community. Uh, after that, we try to focus on groups that are Pasco groups, but then it becomes kind of a first come first serve basis. Whoever makes the first request then would be allowed to use that facility. And then of course, depending on that group, they would either uh, pay a fee for that uh, use of that facility or that, that building. Uh, currently, the process is an outside user group. Uh, they submit a request. That can be done a couple of different ways. Uh, on the district website under community, they can contact our facility staff via telephone. They can download a, uh, a uh, uh, application form that they can fill out that they can submit. That can be done to the district office. It can go to the school. Um, so there's a few ways to make that request. Uh, the form is then reviewed by the district staff, and then we look at it from the standpoint of do we need insurance papers? Is, or if they're saying they're a nonprofit, we collect a 503C form, um, 501C3 form, or other documents that we need to say, okay, they have the insurance they need to, to rent the facility. Once that's received, then uh, our staff takes that and we submit it out to the school that's had the facility that's been requested, and then it goes to the building principals and they have the opportunity to approve or deny that at the, at the school level. Uh, some of the challenges that go along with this, and I think when I say this, if Sarah presented this earlier, 
that our current policy was written in 1996. You know, back probably we had 8,000 or less students at the time. And so things have changed a lot, and there's a lot more demand for facilities right now. So it's becoming, uh, uh, that's become a challenge. The, uh, the paper process that we have, you know, anytime you have a paper process, there's an opportunity for it to set too long on one desk or get moved to another or before it gets to the right place. So there becomes gaps where things get missed or there's a delay in the approval or denial process where somebody doesn't hear for a while. Uh, that can happen. The, uh, the other thing is because we have basically then we have 22 points of contact throughout the district for approval and denial. And of course what can happen with that is then there can be double bookings and then somebody loses access to the facility when they had it scheduled. And of course that creates frustrations uh, you know, for the outside user groups and for the, for the schools themselves. So there's, there's multiple things that are happening there. So along with that, um, the district's been working on some recommendations, you know, things that we can look at moving forward. Uh, some of those recommendations, and this was mentioned earlier, would be a full-time scheduler that would work with the district. Um, that's very similar. Kenwick and Richland both have full-time people that do the facility scheduling for those their, uh, their districts. It pro would provide a single point of contact, not just for the, uh, the outside user groups they're trying to schedule, but a single point of contact for the principals also to coordinate and try to work out those scheduling uh, conflicts if they do happen. Uh, would re reduce the number of contacts that an outside user group would have to use. Would provide support because on those groups that do pay a fee, um, it would help us get the invoicing out faster. There would be a good process that way. And then, of course, there would be a specific focus on the communica communication aspect, both with the principals and the outside user groups. And there would be one point of contact for that. Uh, along with that, we're looking at online facilities use. Uh, I think that's been mentioned before. Uh, we're going to wait to see what the policy is like, how that ends up, and then we can implement that online facilities use form so it, it complements that, that policy. Uh, it allows ease, ease of access to request facilities by the outside user groups. Electronic submittals will provide better tracking for the district. Uh, it'll support timely response to the requesters so they get to hear back faster whether they've been approved or not denied. And uh, another thing we have to do, it'll provide easier cost estimating for those so we can get that information back to the outside users that are actually gonna pay a fee too. Uh, another thing we've been working on is we've been working with Kennewick and Richland School Districts. We've been meeting with them to standardize um, our facilities use fees. They may not be exact, but they'll be very close to each other so that throughout the three districts, they'll be very similar so that not one district is charging more in one area and another district less in another area. So uh, we've been working on that also, and it'll provide some consistency uh, for the groups that are trying to use our facilities because many of them, they will, they'll, they'll work with us, they'll work with Kenwick and Richland, and when the fees are different, that can, that can create some challenges. So that's just an overview of where we're at right now, kind of where we've been, what we're looking at now, and, and uh, what we're looking forward to. Okay. Superintendent Whitney and board members, thank you for the opportunity and, um, to come and just to address this. I, First off, I want to say uh, we are so grateful as a city for the interlocal agreement that we have with the schools, um, both as you know as organizations that are tax funded and supported. Um, I think there's that um, that need and expectation that we need to serve the community, and being able to use each other's facilities makes better use of those tax dollars and, and serves our community better. So, again, thank you for the many years that we've had that agreement in place and. Um, on that. Uh, everything that Randy said uh, kind of goes along right along the lines with, with what I'm thinking and, and what needs to be done. Um, ask, being asked our perspective or the perspective of the city, that, that are, those are the problems that, that we see. Um, multiple double bookings of, of facilities. Uh, you know, we had to, we use the, a lot of the schools for our youth basketball program. Uh, Never fails, start practicing, uh, come in, oh, hey, there's already a team here. Uh, you know, we, of course, submit our dates, you know, as our agreement says, uh, through Eli at the district, 
you know, back in August for, for our time's use at the facilities. Um, but you get there and, and they say, oh, yeah, we booked it with the secretary here, you know, and, you know, uh, he talked about the, the process right now of, of getting things approved and, and whatnot and saying that it goes back to the, to the principals for them to sign up. I, from the things I've seen and things I've talked to I, and just how busy principals are, I don't think those principals see all of those very often. It's often the secretary that um, deals with those, those re facilities requests. Um, again, not, not the most uh, efficient communication and consistency is just not there. Um, again, also, he talked about the priority usage, of course, the school districts, you know, the schools in the district uh, programs and things, of course, take first priority. Um, and then with the, the hierarchy there with the interlocal, then goes to the city recreation and, and the Boys and Girls Club, other, uh, other groups after that. Um, even with that in place of those priorities, I think with all the different schools scheduling their own things, uh, they have very often, they'll have their school program scheduled, but it's not actually put on to the district calendar or whatever. And so we're approved for coming in for an activity, but then they're like, oh yeah, no, we have this school um, uh, band concert, you know, or whatever this night. and. Um, oh yeah, okay, now deny. And it's two days before the, the event or the day of, or we've had it at three o'clock when they're th scheduling there to be at five o'clock, you know? So um, just too many points of contact, too many separate calendars. Uh, you're not able to keep that communication consistency. Um, And about the process, again, agreed with going to electronic and whatnot. I actually, I've submitted a few facilities requests myself in the last little bit. And, you know, I go on and you have to find where it's at on the website, which is, you know, a little difficult at times. And you find it and you click it and it's just the, the old type that you have to download and print and print out and fill out by hand and then s scan and email back or whatever. I actually took it myself. and use my PDF writer to make it a fillable one. I fill it in myself. <laughs> email that to you. I can email that to you. <laughs> so, um, so just going to, uh, you know, even beyond that, uh, where they can just go into a system that you submit the request right there. Um, I've talked to Randy uh, about, uh, you know, again, because this is a joint use agreement, you guys, we have softball fields, baseball fields, track, uh, and most recently we would be able to work with the schools to give use to the of Memorial Pool um, for the swim, you know, for the new swim teams. That using those facilities is, you know, is a great way to save on tax taxpayers' dollars that way. And so, um, I think going to something like that would be great. And I, and we have in our system now for for uh, the schools as far as submitting the requests for use of ours where you can just go on to our website click the thing and, and submit it so we can get that request and, and approve it to you so but anyway i also wanted to thank you for your work and effort in refreshing our agreement um, sarah randy and i were able to meet with mr dota and a representative from the city on your behalf and walk through that document and I believe that there's a collaborative effort to bring that to closure mm -hmm. and one of the things that we committed to do in um, once the completion of that refresh of that is is um, done is my understanding is there used to be a mechanism by which there were a couple of different layers of meetings that occurred kind of mm -hmm. at the beginning of mm -hmm. the year where district staff and city staff reviewed the interlocal agreement and then like our ADs and potentially other staff met mm -hmm. annually to just refresh each other's memory about what was required under the interlocal agreement and have some collaborative dialogue. So we made that commitment that once this interlocal agreement was refreshed that we would restart that practice that both the, the district and the city felt like really worked well to build those collaborative relationships and kind of identify the face with the name in terms of points of contact. So I thank you for your work on that interlocal agreement and, and we're looking forward to getting that kind of that loop closed so that we can start those conversations again. We really value your partnership and together know that we can make the process better. Yes, thank you. 
Any other questions? Do we Is still have schools that don't allow you to come in and use them? Um, school to school is we get varying responses um, some we are welcomed others it's it's more difficult to um, just you know by principals ad's you know whoever on top there but so how many of these basketball because basketball teams right now and how many schools do you have practices right now <laughs> The exact number I couldn't say right off, but we're probably in at least 10 of the 17, okay. right, 17. And is that because the other schools. ones won't let you in, or is that because uh, you no, only need those No, not always. 10. A lot of it is, uh, you know, because we try with our youth basketball, we have almost 500 kids in, in the youth basketball program, um, and we try to, for the most part, try to group them by school, by area that they live in um, and have their practices at the schools that are closest to them. Why? To make it easier for parents, e easier for, you know, for everyone and they can relate to and And so a lot of it's that is where did the, where did the kids come from, who signed up and, and is there that school available? Um, so, you know, we have most all the west side schools have them and, and uh, you know, a good number of the, the east side schools, but not all. Just from my understanding, and this is for Mr. Nunnemaker, is there currently, if not a full-time person, a single point of contact? Because I think a lot of the frustration is that I've heard is people tell me that they think they have a single point of contact. And what happens from there where it gets passed around to principals and everything else, they don't know about that, right? Most people don't. And without saying names again, but people think that they have a single point of contact. Do we not currently have a full-time or part-time person working on this? You said, sorry, you said we have to hire somebody, but do we not have anybody? We have a part-time person that helps facilitate the outside user groups that want to submit. But once they submit, then it leaves their contact and it goes to the schools. Mm -hmm. So they don't have that, that one person because they're part-time. They don't have time to go to each school to contact each school on every outside user group to do that once it gets turned over to the school. And the school is the one that takes it from there to approve or deny and coordinate with the, the outside user. Thank you. So when you get the system in that's more, that's more digitalized and they can submit online and request online, I assume the principals will also will be the first to submit all of their events so those, those, or are the principals still going to be in charge of each individual? How's that going to work? Well, that was to be determined yet, but the idea would be that there would be, with the central point of contact like that, the district and the schools would have first priority and schedule theirs first, and then after that, <coughs> then we would schedule in behind them. And then, and I think with the city, uh, and we've done this before, there's, there's full seasons that they have. So there's a time that we have that we'll work with some of the schools to say, okay, we need to have your information by this date because then we know what the openings are. We can provide that information to the city and then they can schedule their teams around that. So there's coordination that, that still happens right now on those larger ones, but on the individual ones, that's where we, we also get into some trouble. And we as a board realize that this is difficult for our schools because it, there is an impact on schools and there's things that, that make it difficult. But we are committed to our community, not just to, um, just to district. And obviously district comes first and then the community. But, but I'm grateful for these partnerships. And, and I'm hoping that I know that was one complaint we had a lot of for a while where parents were like, this school will let us, this school won't. and so. With, through our policies, we're trying to, to protect and to, and to facilitate um, at the same time and, and solve some of these problems. So if that's not happening, we as a board need to know. I, I think exactly that feedback is what triggered this in-depth process mm -hmm. is we do know that, that the process is clunky and, and the outcome of this is for us to fix that. And you have, we, we're fully committed to that. And I can speak from personal experience, I was contacted by an outside user group and asked to help facilitate the solution to what was a, so, or a soccer field issue. And it literally took me 18 hours of time to unweave the noodle and figure out what the 
the path forward was. And it was really about kind of six different people and contacting and saying, will this time work? Oh, this one won't work? Okay, but will this one work for you? And, you know, like I worked it and we got it all figured out and got everyone taken care of. So that's just one example. And, and I did it purposefully to see where are the holes in our process? You know, how much time and effort does this really take? And some from, from a place of knowing, understand, okay, you know, here are the issues that we need to fix. And all of us are committed to working through it and, you know, and, and having a singular point of contact with some additional time that can help kind of walk through those conversations there's really no problem we can't solve given enough time to, to make the right contacts and communication. So before we go any further, thank you, Mr. Kabalik. Thank you for coming and, and uh, just reaffirming some of the things that we need to address. And uh, we do value our partnership with the city on many, many <coughs> levels. Mm -hmm. Building usage, we've, we've got uh, lots of things with the city that we want to maintain a good relationship with. And so you guys do provide great information for us and so we uh, we appreciate you coming tonight and, and uh, helping us out so, so are you back on sarah you got just, more just to sort of bring all right bring it all to closure um and and do you want the questions now or after you bring it to closure <laughs> well let what i'd like to do is at least set the stage for sort of the Again, sort of a reminder of the purpose of this, and then what the next what the next steps are, and then I think we'll open it for questions. You know, sort of keeping in mind for you as a as a board, throughout the last um, two or three meetings on this topic, you've heard um, some some very different perspectives around what um, highlighting kind of what some of the tensions and conflicts are around this particular this particular topic, and the point of this process is for that information to inform form how you as board want to identify the priorities that we push back into that facilities use policy so we've sort of you know sort of everybody's gone you know kind of peering down into the weeds and so we're going to bring you at the next the, the the next step in the cycle would be to kind of bring you back out of the weeds and talk about just general directions and priorities what's important to you as a board collectively then we can put that in a policy that drives what the appropriate procedure would be. So just to kind of give you a big picture of where where those perspectives would, would go. Um, and at this juncture in the process, we can either provide more information to you for additional input, or we can start moving into that direction process at the next meeting. So that's just how I wanted to wrap that up. Well, I love this process. I think this is great. Is And I think this is the first that we've really done this way. It, I think it's just so much more effective to hear the community, to hear our schools, and, and then to make policy and driven around around that voice. So thank you so much. I'm excited to see this work continue. Well, and, and, and we'll see how it turns out, right? I mean, this is the first time we've done this. So honestly, when we're done, we'll be coming to you for feedback on how we might tweak it moving forward. Oh, we're not done, are we? No, you got 15 whole minutes. That's good. Yeah. I tell you, this reminds me, so, so I'm just thinking of church. We schedule church buildings in our church, and that, that, there's a nice, robust online thing, and it's still very, very frustrating. <laughs> so there's not going to be any easy answers here. Um, but I, I do think, and, and I'm looking forward to your recommendations as to what we do, but certainly we've got to address this issue of double booking. I know for principals, I mean, it, it's their building and their domain and and they ought to be able to use it when they need it. And sometimes that can be just emerging issues. Mm -hmm. However, we've got to, um, when we're talking about basketball practices and things like that, we have to, we have to recognize that those things are scheduled well in advance and that we need to honor those agreements that we've got with them. So, and, uh, you know others as well it, there needs to be something where i mean certainly we can't so again using the church analogy if you get on a year in advance and schedule it you think that you're locked in right well that's that's wonderful except that we're not all that organized and sometimes things come up so we can't just because you're in there a year in advance doesn't mean that now you're locked in because because things do come up so we've got to uh, have policies that way as well that um, that it's not just first come, first served. And the other thing that's interesting, you're talking about soccer fields or baseball fields or, 
or in the, on the city side, shelters where you're, they're outside facilities and if somebody shows up and nobody's there, it's, it's open, right? So if I'm here and, and nobody's using it, then, then it's my field or my shelter and that's not necessarily the case. So I'm curious to know how you're gonna solve that one. <laughs> Any other comments from board members? I guess I, I'd like to see, um, we talked about a educational lottery. Sometimes I feel like the facility use is a lottery, not talking about who rents it, but let's take the example. Some of our schools, kids can go after school and they can go shoot baskets and they can go play on the baseball fields and they can do stuff. Other schools, lottery-wise, have locks around the perimeters and they're locked out. There's not consistency. I might live near one school, and my school is locked up, and I can't go play there. I live in another neighborhood. I can go there until 7 p.m. I live in another neighborhood. It's closed at 4.30. I'd like to see some kind of consistent policy for the outside play field so that if, if we need to lock them up, if there's really a reason we need to lock them up, then they should all be locked up around the same time. If they don't need to be locked up, let's not be locking them up at 4 p.m. And also, if possible, is there ways to expand the opportunities for kids to use gyms, not, not through the city, not playing, but to go use open gyms and open the schools for a certain amount of time? Because one of our outcomes is to get kids involved in extracurricular. Not every kid has the opportunity or the resources or the parent support to participate in organized activities, but having gyms open um, is a great thing for them there too. Um, and I, I'm excited to see our broken policy, um, not broken, but our policies get fixed so that people see more consistency, um, whether it's a single point or whatever the fix is there. Um, and then one other thing I had was on fees, I'm glad to hear that you guys are talking to the other districts. Um, I think it's going to start impacting us more, and if we need different fee structures for different groups, I fully support that. But an example is I have friends who's kids play in Kennewick or Richland and play AAU basketball. Let's say Kennewick is charging more money for AAU because AAU charges um, entry fees. And I fully support that. I think Kennewick has the right to do that. But where it starts to impact us if we're not doing the same thing is they start to say, well, I'm not going to go reserve, AAU is not going to go reserve in Kennewick. I'm going to go to Richland and or Pasco because it's cheaper and they're not doing it. And if it's the right thing to be consistent and to charge groups that are charging entry fees more money, I would fully support having more fee structures than we currently have and, and to try and be consistent with those other districts so that we don't get an inordinate amount of other people coming over and, and <laughs> filling our facilities, so. Yeah. Okay. yeah. To the point Mr. Christensen was making uh, about churches, I think that's a good analogy and, and I think one of the the problems that we see there is that you have thousands of users that don't understand the system and so it may work from a organizational standpoint it seems like the right thing and and I, I kind of disagree with the if someone schedules something a year in advance and we've committed that they get it so so the problem is the balance between we say you know our students are first so if if Curie if they their sixth grade teachers want to have an activity, you know, in three weeks on a Saturday, and it was reserved six months ago by the basketball. I think the basketball gets it, and, and there has to be some central understanding of essentially anything that the schools are going to schedule outside of the school day is going to have to pass some sort of central scheduling to confirm that it's not already scheduled by a group because that's honoring a commitment that we've made to someone in our community. So in my mind, that's that would be a, no, you can't do that. You're going to have to pick a different day because basketball is scheduled that day. We've committed to this group for these dates. And so there has to be some central component to that. Along with what Mr. Lerman was saying, I had a couple thoughts. You know, I had a similar thought of, you know, we really want to expand our extracurricular activities for students. We know that that keeps them engaged in school. Uh, the numbers that we were presented recently showed that our middle school students participate, 50% of them, in athletics, and in high school it's 25%. I mean, that's just crazy. It should be the same or higher, and, uh, and so I, I can see that this is going to become uh, an important part of this discussion is either the development of some sort of intramural high school sports to, to get 
to keep those hundreds or, of students active and engaged. And so that's going to have to be part of this. You know, what, what's going to sort that out? Do we have a, our middle school programs that do we organize something similar in high schools? And I think they're probably working on something like this, but that needs to be part of this discussion. This is a little bit unrelated, but I just want to throw it out there just to kind of uh, put it out there since we're talking about facilities use. I've kind of always wondered, I haven't had a high schooler yet, but the use of the libraries, uh, mm. that's been always a question of mine. I haven't looked into much yet, but kind of we've gone to more curriculum that's, that's uh, online, and I worry a lot about our students that may not have access to internet at home. Uh, what is their ability to access their curriculum and homework and, and uh, things? So, you know, what are the hours of our school libraries before school, after school, at lunchtime, on non-school days? Now, certainly we have public library. We have the West Pasco Library and, and the Pasco branch, both branches of the Mid-Columbia Library. But uh, anyways, I'd like that to kind of make sure that we're addressing that as well. And since that also involves the use of our facilities. Any other comments? All right. Well, thank you, Ms. Thornton. We uh, thank you for coming. We'll assemble again at 6:30 for our regular board meeting.